Are your thoughts out of control since you found out about your spouse's infidelity or sexual addiction? Do you feel like you are going crazy? Hi, I'm Kim Pullen and welcome to the Hope for Spouses Lunchtime Live. Now, this is your first time visiting us. Welcome. I started this ministry a few years ago because I myself had been through some of the challenges that you may be going through right now. My husband and I separated for about four years due to his adultery. And while he was working through a lot of his stuff, uh, he lived with his affair partner for a little over two years, and then he started his recovery process. Uh, meanwhile, I went through my own uh, healing process. I went through the um, some re recovery groups, but I really got dived into God's Word and really pulled a, a safe community around myself and really launched myself into recovering God's way. And so I started this because I realized there were a lot of ladies out there who were dealing with these same issues. And if you're one of them, you're probably stumbling around trying Trying to figure out you know what where do I go what do I do and and if you are uh, a disciple of Jesus somebody who really wants to honor God's Word then there is a way and there is hope and I hope you will find it here in our ministry so um, we're going to talk a little bit about this uncontrollable thinking that sometimes can happen with us when uh, we've been betrayed by our spouse and just the 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 storm that rages in our head that we feel like we can't stop. So in my recovery, I'm a fitness instructor, and during my recovery, I really used uh, exercise. Um, Zumba was one of my, I was a Zumba instructor. Um, Zumba and yoga, you know, uh, strength training, and it really, really helped me to focus my mind um, for a couple hours every day uh, just to, clear out the cobwebs and to kind of really get back to where where I needed to think. So it helped me to really focus. Now in traditional Eastern thought, okay, it says that the epitome of peace is to empty your mind. But our mind is like a vacuum. So if there's any space there, something's going to always rush in to fill it. Um, I want to share a scripture with you. And this is in... Um, in Luke chapter 11 so it says when an impure spirit comes out of a person it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it then it says I will return to the house I left when it arrives it finds the house swept clean and put in order then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the final condition of that person is worse than the first that's Luke 11 24 through 26 okay so you know our mind is like a door all right um, now think about this would you leave your front door open all the time to just whoever wants to walk in you know of course not um, and so even when we don't practice some kind of Eastern mysticism to open our mind to foreign or dangerous thoughts that may come into it um, and I'm not saying, I mean, I'm a huge fan of yoga, so yoga is what you make of it. You don't have to practice Buddhism or, or um, a religion that doesn't agree with Christianity um, to be able to reach, uh, achieve and benefit from yoga. So I'm just, <laughs> just a little bit there. But, you know, we don't have to, like, practice some kind of weird stuff in order to let dangerous thoughts come into our mind, okay? So I'm talking about dangerous things like primetime television, all right? Um, magazines, yes, even Facebook, okay, or YouTube, um, driving down the interstate and all the billboards that bombard you, other people, what other people say about you, or even what you think about yourself. All of these, these can be dangerous thoughts that you have going on in your head, okay? And we get bombarded all day long by negative and dangerous thoughts all right so the problem is that we don't always recognize them as dangerous and even insidious in the way that they change our thinking so what if what is out of control thinking really look like okay so basically it's there's no purposeful thought you know it's it's like cable TV, you know, open sewer to whatever random thoughts float in, you know, advertising this, that, I mean, sometimes some advertising's worse than the shows that you're watching, okay? So it's basically listening to everything that comes in 
And it's no wonder we have a hard time. So we're just we're just taking in all these thoughts that come at us all day long, and we're not filtering them with anything. You know, we're not um, we're not using any kind of a filter to ask: Is this really the way I need to be thinking? Is is this really really what is true? And uh, so I'll give you an example. I have a son with autism. Now, aut- autistic individuals, you may have seen some autistic people do what we call stemming, okay? Um, they may wave something in front of their face or they may, you know, rock back and forth and hum, you know, as they, as they go back and forth. And that's literally telling you that they are overwhelmed. There are so many things around them going on that they can't focus on one thing because their uh, system, uh, their, the way that their brain is wired, they can't close down things. Like when you're sitting in a restaurant, how there can be all these people talking around you and yet you can focus on the one person in front of you and you can block out everything else. You can still hear it, but it's in the background. Well, a lot of autistic individuals can't do that. And I think sometimes in the wake of uh, our spouse's betrayal, we can sometimes be like that. Well, we have a hard time blocking out all the stuff that's hitting us. and We can't focus on one thing. So, you know, how are you stemming emotionally when all the stuff hits you? You know, what are you what do you do to block it? So especially when our spouse pulls the rug out from under us with their betrayal, and we realize, you know, only then just how unruly and undisciplined our mind has become. So for me, after my separation, you know, it was really, really hard because um, I mean, my husband had refused to give up his affair partner. I had asked him to move out, and he did. And I really felt like I had almost no control over my thoughts. I mean, they were all over the place. And I had, I mean, I sometimes had a hard time carrying on, you know, a single train of thought in a conversation. It was just bouncing all over the place like a, like a pinball machine, okay? And sleep, oh my goodness. <laughs> At least when I was awake, I could keep myself busy. I could do laundry. I could do the dishes. I could get my kids ready for school, whatever, you know. But when I, when I, my head hit the pillow, it was like a tsunami of thoughts just bombarded me. And I could not think. Or uh, I could think. That was the problem. I was thinking too much. It was just too much. You know, and I, I would sometimes, you know, at least for the first couple of months, I only got maybe three to four hours sleep. Um, for the first few months after my husband and I separated because it was just so hard. I, it, was, it was almost embarrassing how out of control my thinking was. And I think that's what you know, the world does when it bombards us with all these negative thoughts. And it continues, continuously does that. It screams at you. It cajoles you. It manipulates you. It seduces you into thinking the way that it does. But you know what? God isn't like that. All right, let's look in, uh, it's 1 Kings, 1 Kings um, chapter 19, I'm going to bring that up for you. 1 Kings chapter 19, it says, the Lord said, go and stand on the mountain. He's talking to Elijah here, in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he knew it was God. So he pulled his cloak over his face because you can't see the face of God and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. All right. So here, you know, we sometimes, and I You know, I think we can be guilty of this. We want this great thing to have. We want God to shout to us from, you know, the heavens. We want an angel to come and talk to us. We want we want to hear it absolutely clear. But see, God doesn't communicate to us through, you know, fire or an earthquake or a raging storm or a wind or anything like that. See, God doesn't need to scream. He doesn't need to manipulate. You know, you know, those those are the ways that the world tries to get our attention. God whispers to us, and anyone who wants to really hear him can. They just have to listen and really recognize his voice. Now, Jesus talked about this in John 10, and it says, The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name 
and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, Jesus, of course, is the shepherd bringing us out. He goes on ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from a stranger because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Okay, so Jesus said that anyone who is part of his flock, anyone who is his disciples, will recognize the difference between his voice and a stranger's voice. And they will run from a stranger's voice. They won't follow it. They're going to turn and follow Jesus. They're going to listen to his voice because they recognize it. So if you don't recognize Jesus' voice in the cacophony of your head that's going on right now, it might be because you aren't reading his word enough. You aren't diving into the scriptures and getting familiar with what Jesus says and how he says it. So you're not filtering the stuff that's coming into your mind from the world. Now remember what we're looking at in Luke 11, that Jesus wasn't saying, you know, with the, the demons coming in the house and clean it and then a whole bunch more came in. He wasn't saying we need to empty our mind. Instead, we need to be deliberate and purposeful about what we choose to fill our mind with. Okay? So what does it mean to have deliberate thinking? You know, um, how, how, how do we really demolish these strongholds that take root in our mind? Because I know, I remember how hard it was just to, uh, there was these thoughts, these negative thoughts that just kept hitting me and I didn't know how to get rid of them. So I think if you're really serious about this, I want you to start thinking about what and how you think, okay? It's really meditating on what is going on in your head. Not the individual thoughts, but the process of what's going on in your head is what are you letting in and, and, and are you filtering it and what are you using to filter it, okay? In 2 Corinthians 10, we're, gonna use, we're using a lot of scriptures today. In 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, it says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Now, if your spouse is an unrepentant sexual addict, okay, then he is probably using the weapons of the world, okay, deflection, passive aggressiveness, manipulation, you know, screaming, you know, we can sometimes use these codependent controlling behaviors, obsessing, avoiding, making him feel guilty, you know, how could you do this to me? You know, we can be using those weapons to try to get back at our spouse or wake them up or whatever. But that's not how God works, okay? Let's finish up this passage in 2 Corinthians. It says, On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. All right? So, and we're not talking about the arguments that we have with our spouse, you know, what they're saying to us, even though those things are very real, we're simply talking today about what's going on between our ears, okay? Because that's the only thing we can really control, all right? You know, our arguments that are going on in our head that are fighting against the knowledge of God. And see, God's word is what helps us to overcome those things. And then we can literally wrestle those thoughts to the ground and make them obedient to God's word. All right. We control our thoughts. They don't control us, you know, but that takes hard, hard work. It took me, I know when my husband and I first separated, I think I've shared this before, but um, it took me like three or four months for me to be able to get up in the morning, you know, and be able to not think about my husband, what he was doing, who he was with at that very minute. It took me like three or four months to get up and not think about him for 10 minutes when I first woke up. And I remember I did a, I did a Snoopy dance in the middle of my bathroom um, because it was like, wow. I've been able to rein in my thoughts for 10 minutes. But it was like that was the degree that my mind was out of control. And I, it took hard work every single day to be able for me to get there. So I know what the battle feels like. Now, if this stuff that I'm talking about, using God's word to change your thinking, if this stuff feels foreign, incomprehensible, or even silly to you, like, like trying to read ancient Greek, you may not be a disciple of Jesus. Now, bear with me here. You know, keep your mind open to this because the Holy Spirit really helps us in aiding us in understanding these things. You know, you may have gone to church your whole life. You, you know, may have been told a lot about Jesus and even you may believe in him. But if you never became a disciple the way it teaches in the book of Acts, you know, you may be trying to fight this battle 
with human strength. And, and we can't. It's impossible. To, this, is, this is a spiritual war that we're in. We have to use spiritual weapons. So if you feel like you're overwhelmed, you may be losing. All right? So let's look at, at, at um, in 1 Corinthians and see what he, he talks about this. He says, We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, or incomprehensible. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. All right, so our battle starts right here between our ears, and it rages down to reign inside of our heart. All right, so we, it has to start here, which really gets down to our heart and really um, helps us to be able to do what God wants us to do. So what do we what do we use? What are what are our weapons that it talks about in Ephesians six? I'm not going to put this passage up, but in Ephesians six, I want you to look it up in verses twelve through through seventeen. He talks about the weapons that we use. He talks about truth. He talks about righteousness, taking action, being ready, you know, to to act spiritually. Um, uh, faith, uh, salvation, and, and the word. And all of these things are weapons that we use in uh, this battle that goes on between our head. Okay, so what does it mean to fill our minds with the right thoughts from God's word? All right, so I, when I first became a Christian, I was kind of ridiculed for being brainwashed. And, um, you know, that, oh, you're being told what to think. You're not thinking for yourself. Well, you know what the crazy thought is? Is the world does that to us all the time. <laughs> you know, you know, we don't realize that we're getting brainwashed by the world every time we turn the TV on, every time we open up a magazine, every time we drive down the highway, we are being brainwashed to think the way the world does. So really, brainwashing is just perspective, you know, um, who, who we choose to get our brainwashed by. Now, Jesus welcomed his brain to be you know, filled up with the things that God wanted to fill up. I mean, he was bombarded by a lot of worldly stuff. You know, just because he lived in the first century didn't mean it was, you know, that it was, um, n n everything was nice and easy and smooth, okay? All right, so in John chapter 12, verse 49, um, it says, uh, For I did not speak of my own accord, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say, and how to say it. Okay, so Jesus, um, Jesus himself, you know, accepted the fact that I do not speak on my own, but the God who sent me, I'm going to say exactly what God wants me to say, and I'm going to say exactly the way that he wants me to say it. You talk about brainwashing, okay? So Jesus thinking so much like God that he was brainwashed. Now, we're called to be his disciples. We're called to be just like him. So, you know, we can do that. We can fill our minds with what God wants us and we can say what he wants us to say and think the way that he wants us to think because we are called to be like him, to think like God and ultimately to think like Jesus. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, he, um, Paul talks about this. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind in your relationships with one another. Oops, sorry. Went, went too far. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ. All right? So we're called to have the same thinking that Jesus is. We're literally called to change the way that we think and think the way that Jesus does. How do we do that? Through the scriptures. Now, in Philippians, um, in chapter 4, because we were just in Philippians, but Paul continues in chapter 4. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So, you know, Paul even went to the extent of it wasn't just... Um, you know, what he was thinking, it was like, take to, you know, put into action what I'm doing. You know, in um, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I want to encourage you. I mean, I'm not Paul and I'm not Jesus, but 
this is an area where God has really helped me to rein in a lot of my thoughts. And, and I really want to encourage you to imitate my example as I'm Im imitating example of Christ. Is really take these scriptures to heart, put them into your mind, and this is how you're going to be transformed. This is God's word. There's power here. Now, um, I want to finish uh, scripture here in Romans. So this is Romans 12 too. And we I talk about this one a lot because I, for me it is the, really the epitome of our transformation from you know this um, codependent controlled mindset trying to control our spouse or trying to run away from fear. I think this is a, a passage that we really really need to own. He says, "Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing." and perfect will all right so you know our minds need to be washed they need to be scrubbed of the crud that the world has filled our mind with and if you have a hard time reigning in your thoughts you have a hard time then i really encourage you to really start using god's word to do that now if you don't know how to do that i can help you there Okay, so if you are ready to get off the roller coaster of uncontrollable thoughts and get off the insanity loop, you know, if you've never, if you're not really, uh, if you've never really studied the Bible uh, or if you're not in the Bible and you don't know how to use it to get control of your thoughts, then I want you to do something. I want you to schedule a call with me. Okay, I'm going to bring up another uh, a link here so that you can look at it. So if you're tired of being in the insanity loop, all right. When well, you're doing the same thing over and over, expecting different results, you're thinking the same things over and over and you can't get control of your mind, then it's time to be transformed. It's time to renew your mind. So I want you to schedule a call. It's a free call. We'll get onto the phone for 45 minutes or an hour. We're going to talk through your situation. You know, my goal is to give you clarity, some direction, and really use the scriptures to help you transform the way that you think. Um, I do a, a coaching program as well. Um, and if you're a good fit, I'll talk to you about that. But no pressure on the phone. Um, but I really want it's don't let the, the whole thing with um, getting on the phone with a stranger and all that. Hey, this is something I've wrestled with my whole life. I am committed to helping ladies just like you to really work through these issues. So um, if you're serious about really wanting to do that, if, you're, if you've tried all these other things and nothing else is working, then I really want you to go ahead and schedule that call and, um, and we'll talk. Okay? So again, this is Hope for Spouses, Lunchtime Live, and we'll see you next week. Take care.